people are carrying another step towards uh, getting to England uh, this morning. Um, you've always said you wanted to have the horse fit before she gets on the plane. What level is she at now? Yeah, no, she's, uh, she had a nice blow this morning. It was the first piece of work since she's basically won the Goodwood. It was two and a half weeks ago now. So uh, plan was to gallop her this morning and uh, then she'll probably have a final fast bit of work maybe Monday morning before the flight on the Wednesday. So she'll go a bit of pace work again on Saturday, uh, maybe a bit of a work and gallop and then possibly a course proper gallop here again next Monday. And... Uh, That'll tick all the boxes, hopefully, for the trip to go ahead. I mean, you've got plenty of reconnaissance being to England in the past, so you know where you want your horse to be before she gets to England. Exactly. Um, I don't want to need to train her too much over there. Um, you know, you just don't know how the horse is going to handle the trip. Um, I'm confident that she's learned to look after herself well, that she will cope with the trip, but you just never know. So you want to go there not having to train them. You know, you... If you do get to train them there, it's a bonus, basically. Um, if you've got to do work with them there, they've thrived and done very well. So we're prepared to go there on the, the fact that we probably don't have to do any work for basically 18 or so days. Just be trot and canter on the, uh, over there at Newmarket? Yeah, trot and canter and a bit of pace work. And, um, you know, if she thrives, well, I won't hesitate to give her a gallop or two if she needs it, and that'll be a massive bonus. You talk about uh, travelling, and that's the first time she's on a plane, really. Um, what's your feel about how she'll handle all that? Well, my experience with travelling horses on planes is most of them take to it better than they do a truck. You know, there's, uh, you know, once you take off and land, uh, there's less movement. Uh, you know, there's no going around corners and uh, and stopping and starting at traffic lights and uh, having policemen pull you up at stall along the way. So, um, you know, I, that's not too much of an issue. The fact, the the, the concern is you you're boxed for so long. She's going to be in a box for probably some 30 hours, and you get. Uh, a stop over at Singapore and a stop up stop over at Sharjah and cargo planes are third world uh, you know commodities on airports they're pushed and to the left and the right and held up and everyone else gets right away over them so uh, you know uh, you can get held up in Singapore for five or six hours while they load a plane and then they refuel in Sharjah that can be a three or four hour trip so hopefully all that's kept to a minimum but it's something that's totally out of our control and like I say the horse has absolutely no say in it she's stuck in a box with no exercise or no room to move for that period of time. But logistically you've got people obviously traveling with the horse how's that going to work? Yeah, no, we'll get our vet, Peter Angus, will fly over with her, as will Tony Hayden, my assistant, and uh, Paddy Bell will be with them as well. So uh, Paddy's done the trip before. Tony's done a lot of travelling within Australia, and Peter's very experienced in it as well. So Peter's there just in case, uh, you know, we need to administer any fluids or anything like that if there's getting a bit of a dehydration factor or anything. And uh, Tony and Pat will look after her general well-being along the way. So, uh, you know, they're all experienced handlers in that uh, realm of things so uh, touch wood it all goes well. Food and water wise I mean as I say you've been there before but uh, anything you do differently with with her or for this trip? No we take all our own food with us so that's not an issue the water uh, we uh, tend to flavour their water a bit here before they leave and then flavour it over there whether it's a bit of red cordial or a bit of Vegemite or a bit of molasses or something like that so you just take the touch off it you know as we know ourselves every place you go to the water is slightly different and you wouldn't want to to get there and not drink the water but I don't think that'll be a biggie. Once you get there the facilities at Newmarket you know the same box as you've been in before? Yep yeah we'll be housed at uh, Mike de Cox stables uh, at uh, Newmarket and uh, you know like the stables we stayed at a couple of years with Magnus and then with uh, Hinchinbrook last year and most of the Aussies and most of the visiting horses use that and uh, it's adjacent to Clive Britton's place which is over the road where we have access to the swimming pool which we're grateful for there and uh, and uh, you know of course we've got 3,000 acres of gallops so we can go out and sort of choose our own path each morning so you know the workload we try and equate to the same as she would do here um, probably the only one thing she won't have is access to a beach, uh, which we use here. But rather than using a beach, uh, you know, we'll be bathing her in ice water and and the likes, so ice boots and so on, uh, which is the norm for her with her feet, knees, and joints, which always carry a bit of wear and tear. What's Clive Britton's water walker like? Is it similar to the ones we have here? It's just a swimming pool, just a straightforward swimming pool. Actually, it's a bit smaller. He was very pleased when I asked him if I could use it about four years ago. He said they've been laughing there for 25 years at having a swimming pool in England. So uh, it's slightly smaller than ours, but it is a swimming pool, and she'll have access to that, which she enjoys a good swim. But obviously this year there's a different fo uh, scenario because the focus on her is uh, universal. Um, I mean, how are you going to cope and manage with all this? Well, uh, um 
you know, obviously there is going to be a lot of interest and, uh, you know, that's great for the sport and great for the industry, but at the same time I'm not going to allow anyone to upset her routine. Uh, you know, when she's out on the gallop, she's public property, uh, as she is here at Caulfield, but uh, when she goes back into the yard, the gates will be closed and she'll have a downtime, as we will. What about yourself? Uh, when do you head there? And, and Luke, um, just ma managing those sorts of things? Well, I haven't even booked the flight yet, so when she arrives safe and well and settled in, I'll work out when I'm going, but I'll probably be about a week behind her. So I uh, plan to be there probably uh, uh, about the... Thursday week beforehand so then I can assess her condition and uh, see what sort of work we need to uh, put into her in that last sort of 10 days or so uh, whether she needs any solid work or whether we're happy with where she's at and I'll be guided by Tony up into that point but the first three or four days is usually just walking and trotting anyhow until they sort of regain their bodily fluids and weight and that that they lose on the trip over and uh, you know so she'll probably trot and canter for three or four days before I arrive there about a week or eight days behind her. Yeah, looking forward to this, Pete. I mean, I know it's a bit of a it could get some pain in the ass at times, but are you looking forward to this? I am. Uh, you know, obviously to take a horse like her onto the world stage is uh, it's a bit different. You know, in previous years we've gone hoping where um, this year we'll come home disappointed if we don't win. You know, it's just plain and simple. Uh, you know, we're going there expecting to win. Everyone else expects us to win. Um, so, you know, it is certainly exciting. Uh, you know, it's I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit tentative, but nervous about it all. Um, I'd uh, much rather be going around here uh, in, in uh, far more suitable races in our own environment. Uh, I'd feel a lot more comfortable, but uh, sometimes I suppose we've got to take the cotton wool off and and, uh, and go and do these things. It's been a year in the planning, though, isn't it? I remember you saying at Royal Ascot the Tuesday last year when Hinchinbrook was scratched that uh, in 12 months time I'll be here with Black Caviar with 21 wins behind me, and you and you will be. Yeah, no, it was nice to be right. <laughs> yeah, no, so... Uh, that was, uh, that was a long-range plan, and uh, it all seems to have come together nicely to this point. What's the nervousness about, though, We're not getting beaten? What's the nervousness about? Just the travel. It, it does worry me. It, it's, uh, you know, it, it is daunting. Um, you know, and what, what it's going to take away from the horse. Uh, you know, I really want to see her back here in the spring and performing again. Uh, you know, you, I suppose we've run the risk that she could have run a last race in Australia. You know, if she goes over there and if something goes pear-shaped or if she doesn't cope with it well or whatever, you know, it could, could have been the last time we've seen her on a racetrack. You know, that would be very disappointing and sad for me and probably Australian racing in general. Let's hope that's not the case. You've got the July Cup as well, though. I mean, uh, and, and the trip home, how's that going to work? Um, well, I've got two options there. I'm not... Uh, the Diamond Jubilee's the race she's there for. Uh, the July Cup's just a, uh, it, it's, uh, I wouldn't say an afterthought, it's, it's a time-honoured race and it'd be a lovely race to have on her and my resume, but uh, the Diamond Jubilee is her race and I've got the option of putting her into quarantine that night and uh, getting her home as quick as possible or alternatively she can run on the July Cup and go into quarantine the night of that race and come home. Um, we're fortunate enough we've got the facility here at Werribee where She'll basically have her spell in quarantine in England, which I think is about a three or four week quarantine, and then she's got to come home and do another couple of weeks here, which we will do at Werribee, where she'll be able to to work, unlike most quarantine facilities around the world. So uh, it, it's if, if the horse is in good shape, everything's in place for her to come back and race here in the spring. That's good, but uh, you've said on, on record that uh, well, all the Aussie fans who are going to Ascot this year, I'll, I'll get to see a show from, from Black Caviar. That's what you're expecting? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, she's in great form. She's going every bit as good as she ever has. So uh, facts and figures tell you that she should be too good for any opposition that can be put in front of her from anywhere around the world. So we just got to hope that she gets her in great shape. And uh, I'm prepared to back my judgment that she won't run unless she's in 110% order. So I, I won't hesitate to withdraw her even on race morning if I'm not 110% happy with her. It won't matter if there's a million people travel from Australia to watch a race. If she's not on the top of a game, they won't be seeing her. So let's once again hope certainly that's not the case, but I won't risk her in any way, shape or form to put on a show for someone if I don't think she's going to be at a top. You say she's got nothing to prove, has she? Exactly, uh, and least of all to me.